Welcome back to What You'll Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. G'day, everybody. My name is Adam Jones. Today, we are reviewing a very good book, The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing by Al Rees and Big Jack Trout. Now, this is an oldie, but a goodie. And importantly, immutable meaning it doesn't change over time. So, still relevant today. These 22 immutable laws of marketing. You know, don't violate these. If you're doing marketing, follow these rules. So, they're very, very simple laws, but hardly, I wouldn't say hardly anyone, but there's a lot of businesses that just don't follow them as simple as they are. So, billions of dollars have been wasted on whole massive corporate marketing programs that couldn't possibly work from the start. They're doomed from the very beginning because they're violating these laws and they're not following what the big old reason Jack Trout are prescribing. Yeah. They say it doesn't matter how clever or how brilliant or how much money you spend on these marketing campaigns. If you violate one of these laws, you're, you're doomed from the start. The first law is the law of leadership. It's better to be first than it is to be better. Yeah. So, if you think you objectively pick the best product or the best service, you're, you're kidding yourself because almost always you stick with what you know. And people think that, oh, if I make this product better, everyone's going to choose me. But really, you need to be first. So, most companies would believe your your marketing strategy is going to be much better if you've simply got a, a better product. You know, it makes sense now, but what they're saying, that's not the case, is that your intuition might lead you in that direction. But in reality, it's better to be, to be first than it is to be better. If you think about it, there's a fair cost involved in switching. So, if you've got a, a brand of whatever product it is, you're going to stick with it almost always. If something comes along that's slightly better, it's 5% or 10% better, you're very unlikely to change. You're going to stick with what you know because that was the thing that came along first. It has to be like so many times, like multiple times better to change. Otherwise, you're going to go with what's first. So, they say it's better to be first than it is to be better. Who was the first person to scale Mount Everest? Sir Edmund Hillary. Knew that one. Who was the second, mate? No idea. And he also says, they also say- <laughs> Even if he was quicker and he was better, I still wouldn't know, mate, because he no wasn't No one really first. gives a shit, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, another one like the first man on the moon. Yeah, Neil Armstrong. And who was second? Well, it was Buzz Aldrin, but I'll, no, it's probably, you're less likely to know that one, that's for sure. <laughs> Much less. Yeah. So, you know, what they're saying is like- <laughs> What about this one from the book? This is a big one they like to tell in the book. Who was the first person to fly across the Atlantic Ocean solo? Charles Lindbergh. Oh, nice. I don't think I would have known that one. Who Mate, was... we're claiming this, but it's easy when we've got the notes in front of us. <laughs> it's been staged. I'd, I'd... It's obviously staged. I don't think we've fooled anyone. Mate. <laughs> but, mate, so the second person to fly across the Atlantic Ocean solo was uh, Bert Hinkler. Now, Bert Hinkler, he was faster and he used less fuel, but almost nobody heard of him because they all just uh, remember Charles Lindbergh, apparently. So, yes. So, despite the superiority of the Lindbergh approach, so they're calling... Um, the Lindbergh being the first to market, most companies go the Bert Hinkley route. So, they'd yeah. rather go second and wait for the first person to go and then, you know, look at the first person and then find a way to do it better than him. But yeah, in reality, exactly. the market's just going to remember the first one, which in this case is the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, you think it's like, you know, we'll let Charles Lindbergh go first. We'll let him develop the market. We'll let people, you know, start to learn what this Lindbergh product is and we're just going to come along and be Bert Hinkler. We're going to be better. But he says that, you know, in today's competitive environment, a me too product has little hope of becoming big or profitable. So, it's just like saying that, you know, don't be Bert Hinkler trying to come along and do it a little bit faster and a little bit cheaper and a little bit better uh, because everyone's just going to remember Big Charles who went first. He's got an example here of after World War II when Heineken was the first imported beer into the USA and what they're saying now is like, which is better now? The one that tastes the best or Heineken? Yeah. So, saying Heineken does, it's, it tastes, it's pretty it tastes shit. like shit. Yeah. It's a shit yeah. beer. Yeah. But because it was the first to market in the US, that's how it grew to be so big. The first imported beer to hit US shores and it's kind of held on to that advantage the whole time. Yeah, exactly. They say that you know, sometimes being first doesn't guarantee success. So, like sometimes they're just shit ideas. So, they talk about a thing called Frosty Paws, which was ice cream for dogs. And they said it just flopped. That's just, they were the first one, but it was just a shit idea. But even still, first is definitely better than being the second dog, uh, ice cream for dogs because that's even worse. He's got one of the big underlying messages behind this first law. And this underlying message comes across in probably most chapters within the book. But he's saying, so regardless of what reality is, marketing is a battle of perceptions. It's not products. Yeah. So, it's all about how you position in someone's brain and if you occupy a part of the brain as being first, that's better than actually having a better product than the rest. Yeah. And that's going to come back a lot that it's marketing is really all about perceptions, not reality. And that's going to, that's going to come back a lot. 
Now, you know, we've been talking about how it's vital to be first. And if you're second, you're pretty much in strife. But thankfully, there's a couple of other laws that give us a little glimmer of hope. So the second law is the law of category. So it's saying if you can't be first in a category, set up a completely different category to be first in. So back to this Bert Hinkler yeah. analogy. So he says, who was the third person to fly across the Atlantic Ocean solo? If you didn't know Bert Hinkler, you thought you'd have no idea who the third person mm. was. But I think you'll know this person's name, Amelia Earhart. Yeah, exactly, mate. So even though you know we knew the first one, uh, we didn't know the second, but we knew the third because it was a different category because she was the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean solo. So you've got Charles, who was the first overall, but then you've got Amelia Earhart, who was the first woman. So it was a completely different category. Many we, re- we remember her more so than number two, Bert Hinkler. This is one on the fly, mate. But if you say, look at US presidents, I think Barack Obama will always mm. be known as the first dark, dark-skinned dark president. Yeah. Right, and then whoever comes second, no one will remember that person. Yeah, so exactly. Barack Obama wasn't the first U.S. president, but he was the first in the category, and because of that, he's always going to occupy people's brains. And same as Australia, you know, Julie Gillard was the first female prime minister. In that, you probably don't know who the the second prime minister of Australia was, but you in hundred years, you'll probably remember the first female prime minister because it's a new category. Mm. So look, we'll bring it back to marketing, and he's got a really good analogy of beers Mm. right so he says heineken as we said earlier was the first imported beer into the u.s after the world war absolutely huge success yeah so anheuser bush which is the biggest american brewing company they thought if we can bring over an imported beer as well we'll dominate too because heineken this imported beer is doing really well we'll bring an imported beer in too so they brought in carlsberg which was really successful in europe but it, it was seen as just this me too product in the u.s it's a second imported beer so it flopped yeah so instead so after they brought that in and it was an absolute flop what they did is you know they thought if there's a, a market for a high price imported beer that uh that heineken are doing there's also a market for a high price domestic beer mm-hmm. so they went down that route and then they were at the first in the category of high price domestic beer and uh and then this new brand of beer called Michelob was uh, a big success at the time of writing since then, mm. it might have flopped. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's still going in the US. Definitely not in Oz, that's for sure. But like, so then also another category example is Miller Light was the first domestic light beer. So then people thought, okay, if there's a domestic light beer, maybe we could get an imported light beer as well. And then Amstel Light became the first imported light beer. And because it was the first in its category, it was a success as well. So this is absolutely, it's a, it's a big thing. So whatever industry you're in, just think about who are the big players. Don't try and compete with them. Just mm. look at their thing and then try and take one attribute and be the new first in one kind of specific area. So, you know, we've just been going through in the analogy of beer. We had the whole beer, the idea of beer is branded. It kind of got split for domestic and imported, mm. then light and heavy. Yeah. And then, you know, there could be tens of other different categories that are, that you know, specific beers might occupy your mind. Yeah, exactly. It's a little bit like... Um the Blue Ocean strategy, yeah, that we did earlier this season, where rather than just competing and trying to be a better product, you need to find a new Blue Ocean, like a different category in their language here. Find a new category that you can be first in if you can't be first in your category. So again, with this question, when you launch a new product, the first question to ask yourself is not, how is this new product better than mm-hmm. the competition? But instead, you need to ask first in what? So yes. you know, what category can your product be first in? Yes, exactly. I think that's pretty important, especially if you're not going to be first, find a new category, create a new category that you're going to be the first in. I like it. All right, law number three. So this is another extension of the first two and it is the law of the mind. It's better to be first in the mind than first in the marketplace. So this is sort of saying that if you're not first, if there's already another product out there, you've still got a shot if nobody knows about them. So even though they're first in the marketplace, if they're not in people's minds already, you can be the first one in their minds. So the law of the mind follows from the law of perception. And they say, if marketing is a battle of perceptions, not products, like we've said, then the mind takes precedence over the marketplace. Yeah, exactly. So it's not just being first in the marketplace. You need to get into people's minds. So people might just think, I'm going to be the first. I'm going to get this brand new product out there and it's going to be a success. Really, it's nothing, nothing happens until you're actually in people's minds. Mm, exactly. 
He says the single most wasteful thing you can do in marketing is to try change someone's mind. Mm. And that's where millions and millions and billions of dollars are spent in marketing around the world is trying to change people's minds to make them think that they've got a better product. But no, we, we need to occupy a little slice inside their brain. We need to occupy a few neurons that aren't yeah. going to change in the future. Yeah, I like that a lot. It's like a lot of um, books that we've done that talk about you know confirmation bias and things like that, that once you've decided on something, you're almost never going to change your mind. Yes, you might. And if you're more intelligent, you might think someone more intelligent would have the ability to objectively look at something new mm. and then reasonably move to that. But in reality, what they're better at doing is this idea of motivated reasoning. So, they're, be- they're better at finding reasons why their false idea is correct yeah. <laughs> as opposed to just changing what they believe. Yeah, exactly. And this flows nicely into law four, the law of perception, which is we've said a couple of times and obviously it's a big one, is that marketing is not a battle of products, but it's a battle of perceptions. So, there's in marketing and in people's buying patterns, there's no objective reality. There are no facts. There's no product that's better than others. It's really just whatever you think. Uh, or whatever you perceive in your own mind. And the way this plays out is, uh, is you know, th- there might be some products around the world that are better in one country mm. and then be selling a lot better, but then in another country, they're just selling completely shit. So, if there was an objective reality, you think if it's selling, if it's an amazing product in one country, it should be the same everywhere. But in reality, it might be a star here and then flop somewhere else. And mm. he's got this example with the Japanese cars. So, the three largest selling Japanese cars in America are Honda, Toyota, and Nissan in that order. And this is 30 years ago. I don't know what it is today. But you'd think that because Honda is more popular in America, you'd think that Honda makes better cars than Toyota and Toyota makes better cars than Nissan. But it's not really true at all because if you were in America and someone said, oh, I just bought a new Honda, then you might think, oh, what did you buy? A Honda Civic, a Honda Accord, a Honda Pro. You'd you'd assume that they bought a car. But if you go to someone in Japan and you say, oh, I just bought a Honda, they'd say, oh, what type, what type of motorcycle did you get? So, in Japan, Honda is seen as a motorcycle company, but in America, Honda is seen as a car company. So, in Japan, it'd be very tough to sell a Honda car because everybody thinks, oh, that's a, that's a motorcycle manufacturer. They're going to make shit cars. Same as like in the US, Harley Davidson is seen as a, a motorcycle manufacturer. It'd be tough for Harley Davidson to sell cars. Mm, exactly. So the perception, it's all about the perception in people's minds that we believe that Harley Davidson, Davidson's simply a motorcycle manufacturer. But in reality, you know, they could go after new products and all that kind of stuff, but it won't really work. They'll flop because just because yes. our perception of them is kind of ingrained to be this and we're not going to change our minds about them. Yeah, definitely. Which is very true. I think it, it is important because it's, as you know, as Law 4 suggests, it's not about products, it's about perceptions. So marketing is a battle of perceptions, not products. Marketing is the process of dealing with perceptions. I like it a lot, man. We'll skip a couple. We'll skip up to law number nine, the law of the opposite. So, he says if you're in second place, your tactics are very much determined by the leader, whoever's number one. And the thing is you want to do the opposite of what the leader does. So, if there's a dominant player in your market and you're number two, then you need to do the opposite of what the leader is doing to try and capture the people who don't like the leader. So, you must discover the essence of the leader and then present the prospect with the opposite. So, and again, don't try and just do what the leader is doing and match mm. them. Look at them and then try and uh, do something opposite to what they're doing. Because some people will go choose to go with the, the leader because they're the leader and some po- people will choose not to go with the leader because, because they're the leader. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Some people so, don't you, might, you want to go after the people who, who don't want to be with the leader in the yeah, first place. And it's almost, almost impossible and it almost never happens. If you're number two, and you think, I'm going to do what number one does slightly better, you're almost never going to overtake number one. But if you can say, this is what they're doing, they're really strong in this area, I'm going to find what their weakness is and be really strong in it, I'm going to do the opposite, then you've got a chance to overtake them and become number one because you're doing something opposite and capturing a different group of people rather than trying to compete on the same ideas. So, he's got another really good good example here in terms of beer and kind of how categories have split and filtered down into different areas. So, here, as we said, Heineken was the first imported beer. So, then there was another beer that came along, right, right, Heineken's the first imported beer, how can we be a new category? So, Lohenbrau came in as the first imported German beer, so that's another category. Now, Bex were thinking, all right, you know, we're the number one in, in Germany, how can we come into the US as well? So, you know, for their category, 
that Lohenbrau were already number one in this imported German beer. So they had to go after them in some way. And the way they did it, they repositioned Lohenbrau, who were the first imported German beer, the most popular in the USA. And they said this one marketing line to really tackle them down. And it was really good. They said, you've tasted the German beer that's the most popular in America. Now taste the German beer that's the most popular in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, that's sick. <laughs> that's <laughs> Mate, I reckon that's a great, great market. It's just one or two sentences, really simple, that I reckon really dominate. Like, it completely repositions low and brow in your mind and allows Bex that space to come in and be the opposite of low and brow, but really good. So they say, importantly, that there has to be a ring of truth about this negative or this opposite that you're bringing in. So it was true that Bex sold more beer in Germany than low and brow did. Hmm. So Lohenbrau was more popular in the US, but Bex came in with their true opposite thing, saying, look, we're better in Germany, T- try us. So rather than just being the second imported German beer, they came in with this new category that was the opposite yes. of the number one. Because some people would want to have that feel, that authentic feeling experience like they're actually a bit more like the authentic German yeah. as opposed to the imposter USA trying to be, acts like a cool German person when they're not, right? So yeah. it's just... They are occupying another <laughs> part of the brain yeah. than the first imported beer in, in Germany for yeah. the US. Yeah. I reckon it's cool, man. And that's a that's a sick um sick one sentence. Sick one liner. They've got a whole bunch of awesome one liners in here and just, you know, suggestions for other companies as well, which is really good. Uh, the next law we're gonna get into is law number eleven. The law of perspective. Marketing effects take place over an extended period of time. Yeah, you've got to be careful with your short term and long term here in terms of perspective. So they're saying that something that works in the short term is probably going to damage your reputation in the long term. So you've got to be really careful to balance short term wins with long term success. Yeah, you really need to play this long long game and it's analogous to alcohol consumption, right? So if you went on to a bar on a Friday night after work, you know, everyone's 12 beers down, everyone's up and about, they're de- yeah. dancing, they're partying. You'd swear alcohol is a stimulant, right? But if you go back at 4 a.m., you know, there'll be a few of those happy-go-lucky people who are on the dance floor partying around. Right now, they're just passed out on the ground. <laughs> and then, you know, the real colors of the uh, of the depressant shine, you know, it's obviously depressant alcohol, but at times, it might feel like it's getting people up. Yeah, so it's saying that, you know, it is a depressant. So, in the long term, the more beers you have, the worse it's going to end up. But in the short term, this depressant, you know, it lowers your inhibition. So, at the very start in the short term, it feels like it's a stimulant. Because you feel like those first couple of drinks, you're, you're feeling up and about. So, with marketing, we really need to play this long-term game as well. And where most people cook their marketing ideas is the idea of the discounted price sale. Mm. So, when you put something on discount, short-term, you know, people are going to go, oh, it's on sale and then they message their mates and all that and then, you know, they get this short spike in sales. But over time, uh, people aren't going to buy the higher value of it. Yeah. If you have too many sales, then nobody's ever going to buy it at full price. Once they've got that anchor in their mind of this is how much it could be, you know, oh, this 10% off sale, they're almost never going to buy it at full price again. They're going to wait for the next sale. So even though in the very, very short term, there's an immediate increase in business when you do a discounted price sale, over the long term, you're really shooting yourself in the foot. It's a real, um, yeah, real shocking way to do it, to keep having these discounted prices and think that, oh, we're, we're going to do a big sale and we're going to make a lot of money this week by having a sale. You're really cooking yourself in the long term. Absolutely. I think even um, retail in general, man, like I personally probably only buy a bunch of clothes when it's on sale. Yeah. So the whole industry in retail, they have shot themselves in the foot. Like I'll just wait until the end of financial year, boxing day or something, do your shopping then. Yeah. And over time, we're probably going to be spending less that way. And that's the thing because you know that they're always going to have a sale. You're never going to buy it at full price. So it's this law of perspective that, you know, you really, over the short term, you're really killing yourself for the long term. Law number 12, and this is one where a lot of people cook it, is the law of line extension. There's an irresistible pressure to extend equity beyond the brand. Yeah, so they had a lot of quotes from big corporate CEOs of big companies saying that our brand's so important and we want to extend our brand, whereas Al Rees and Jack Trout say this is one of the worst things you can do. This law of line extension by putting your name on everything. So if you're uh, a big bank and you make a new product, then you call it the same name. Or like say he talks about, they talk a lot about Donald Trump in this book that like, you know, there was Trump stakes and, you know, Trump Trump puts his name on everything. And over the long term, it's 
de- uh, devaluing the value of the brand. Yes. Yeah, so you build up this really strong brand name and the equity. You got this expensive and highly valuable brand name, but then you take this and then you start slapping it on all these other different products as well, um, thinking that they're going to be just successful as the first brand. But in reality, as you're doing that, you're diluting the essence of the brand name of the first thing you started with that yeah. was your core business anyway. Yes. And again, it's this idea you might have these short-term wins, but over time, your brand's going to be meaningless. So they say that you know it's better to be strong somewhere than to be weak everywhere. So a good example is in soft drink. So 7up came in as the uncola. So you had Pepsi versus Coke, and then 7up comes in that's not competing with these guys, and they got up to 5.7% of the soft drink market. And then they thought, oh, cool, 7up. People like 7up. It's got this cool name. Then they made Cherry 7up. They made 7up Gold. They made Diet 7up and so on and so on. And when you added up all of those 7up, they actually went down to 2.5% of the market. So because they spread themselves so thinly across six or seven different things, all with the 7up name, they've actually diluted this law of line extension. They violated it and they've actually lost market share overall. So it's this concept of less is more. If you want to be successful today, you have to narrow the focus in order to build a position in the prospect's mind. So again, it's occupying a bunch of neurons in someone's brain and strengthening that as much as possible. So when they their neurons fire up and think, all right, I need this in my life, that your brand immediately occupies that part of the brain. Exactly. It becomes too confusing if you have too many different things. So if you, if you build a strong business and a strong name and a strong brand, if you want to do something else, call it something different. Don't use the same name. They say that the antidote for line extension is corporate courage, a commodity that's in short supply. Absolutely. So saying there's a bunch of wusses out there. Absolute <laughs> wimpy wimpers. <laughs> law 13 is the law of sacrifice. So the law of sacrifice is it's pretty much the opposite of line extension. So rather than saying we want to put our name on everything, instead we're going to have to give something up. We want to sacrifice something if you want to be strong. Again, this sort of less is more idea. So there are uh, three things you need to sac- or three things you can sacrifice, and the first one is the product line. So the world of business is populated by high, uh, big, highly diversified generalists and small, narrowly focused specialists. People think that if you have more to sell, that you're going to sell more. So if you think, okay, I've got this is my number one product. I'm going to, ex- you know, this law of line extension. I'm going to have ten products all with my name on it, and that means I'm going to sell more. But really, that's not true at all. Yes. So again, just you're better off being the narrowly focused specialist, and yeah. this comes up in in a lot of different books as well. I feel I get the feeling, just as a side note, um, a lot of Seth Godin's writings are extensions of some of these laws in his books. And you know, if you think about tribes, it's it's exactly this. It's you know, you're better off being a in a niche. Mate, Seth Godin's a big fan of um, these two dudes. And their other book called Positioning as well. So I definitely agree with that. Mate, one example they talk about is craft. So if you think of craft, that's this brand that's on everything. They've got, you know, they've got peanut butter, they've got jams, they've got sauces, you know, craft everything. They own everything. But when you look at it, craft has the even though they're selling a lot, they're this big generalist, they don't actually dominate any of the areas. So they say that in jam smuckers beats craft thirty five percent to nine percent. In mayonnaise, Hellman's beats craft forty two percent to eighteen percent. They said there's only one product, again, this is a fair while ago, but there's only one product where Kraft dominates the market and it's called, it's their Philadelphia cheese and Kraft has 70%. But the thing is, it's not called Kraft, it's called Philadelphia. Yeah. So it's saying that this, you've got to sacrifice rather than being Kraft for everything, just, you know, pick one thing and focus on it. So if they focus on Philadelphia cheese and they dominate the market. The second thing is the target market. So with this sacrifice is the the people you're targeting when you're narrowly um, specifying a niche you're going out for, you're sacrificing the rest of the target market. So you got to think, who is this specific person you're going for? And that's the person we're going to be going hard at. Yeah, rather than trying to be everything, if you, what's the quote? If you try to be everything to everyone, you end up being nothing to no one or something like that. So saying that rather than trying to target everybody, have a bit of sacrifice and pick a specific narrow niche target market. Mm. So if you look at cigarette advertising, so back in the day, you know, they obviously... If you think about cigarette advertisers must be up there in the world because they had a a ridiculous concept which they (laughs) marketed it to to whatever reason half the world ended up smoking and people were dying and all that and it's just absolute stupidity but they managed to get in people's brains to smoke. Anyway, one of the big ones there was Philip Morris. So, they were going hard and specific on the idea of the cowboy, right? So, they were only targeting men there 
but at the same time, um, that cowboy image extended to other people. So who the people who actually wanted to feel like a cowboy kind of yeah. kind of vibe, they went for Marlboro. Yeah, it's this idea that the target is not the market. So they say that if you go narrow and you go niche and you pick a specific target market, it actually has a bit of effect where it permeates out unintentionally. So like the idea of like Coke was dominating Pepsi five to one. And what Pepsi did was they focused just on youth. So this idea of, you know, the teenagers and early 20s, that Pepsi is the, the drink for the new generation. So even though they're focusing in on just youth, people who were like 50-year-olds started drinking Pepsi because they wanted to feel young. So even though these people weren't in the target market, it still appeals to them. Absolutely. But the, the key there is that you've got to focus first. So yep. sacrifice everyone, pick one target. Focus one and then over time, yep. um, you know, just like crossing the chasm, yeah. go to that highly specified niche. And then over time, you're going for the innovators who will sneeze to the early adopters and then the early majority and so forth. And before you know it, the whole market's I love it. smoking ciggies and drinking Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> so the third thing we gotta we got to sacrifice is constant change. Yeah. So that's a... That's a big sacrifice. As the whole market's moving in different directions, you've just got to simply just stay put in the thing yeah. you've decided from the start. So if you try to follow the twists and turns in the market, you're bound to wind up off the road in the jungle. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> law number 15 is the law of candor. When you admit a negative, the prospect will give you a positive. Yeah, I like this one a lot. Uh, it's like some examples would be like L'Oreal, expensive because you're worth it. Yeah, another good one that I'd like would be the idea, and this isn't in the book, it's a uh, picnic, you know, deliciously ugly. Mm. So, when they're admitting to be ugly, which it is, in the brain, you go, oh, if they're, you know, if they're selling food and they're ugly, they must be tasty. Yeah, they must exactly. be delicious. So the other, as they're claiming one negative, you assumely uh, automatically give them the other positive. Yeah, exactly. So, like, uh, Avis always called themselves the number two in rental cars and because they're the number two, they try harder. Or Listerine said, the taste you hate twice a day like it's a disgusting taste and you just think because it's disgusting it must be seriously killing some really <laughs> dirty, dirty germs <laughs> dirty germs in there right so the the law of candle must be used carefully and used with great skill because you don't want to just be talking yourself down yeah. like, oh, yeah. oh, it's sad. <laughs> we're, we're, this, yeah. <laughs> we're just like uh, you know you're at a bar and you're just i'm really really <laughs> ugly <laughs> You can, it's not going to get you anywhere. You've got to be strategic with how you use it. So one of these things, is it has to trigger instant agreements like Listerine, the taste you hate. Everyone can agree, yeah, we hate that taste. But it also has to shift quickly to the positive that because it tastes bad, we're killing a lot of bad shit. Mm, exactly. So honesty is the best policy. Yeah, definitely. Which is good. Mate, the law of success, law number 18, is that ego is the enemy of successful marketing. So it's sort of like once once you get a bit of success and once you get too big, you start to lose touch with reality in that once a corporation gets too big, they don't really know what's happening on the ground. So Gorbachev told Ronald Reagan, it's better to see once than to hear a hundred times. So they say that for big companies, you shouldn't just be having lots of meetings with all the big wigs in the office. You need to get out and onto the ground and walk around and see things for yourself. Yeah, that's it. So small companies are mentally closer to the front line than the big companies. So that might be the reason they grow more rapidly yeah. uh, in the last decade. He's saying at the time of writing, but it's you know it's still true today. Yeah. The big corporates they're very disconnected with uh, the actual market and you know what people want. Yeah, that's why sometimes as you say, mate, small companies actually understand so they can grow quicker than big companies who have lost touch. So the opposite one to this is with law number nineteen, which is the law of failure, and it's really good. So too many companies go out there and try and fix things rather than just drop things. Yeah, which, so, is, a, which is a big error. Oh, 100%. So they'll you know, develop, develop up this huge marketing campaign and when it's not working, they'll try and tweak that and mm. tweak that and just drop millions and millions of dollars more when in, in the start, they should just drop it. Yeah. And you've got examples in the book of, say, Japan who at the time were you know, killing it in terms of business yeah. because their culture had the humility to just drop things when it wasn't working and mm. move on. Whereas, say, you know, maybe us Western countries uh, aren't as quick to drop things yeah. and admit that we're, we're cooked. They talked about how IBM was dominating computers and Xerox was dominating photocopiers. And Xerox tried to make computers and flopped. And IBM tried to make photocopies and flopped. But they stuck with them. They said that straight away they should have just dropped it and focused on the thing that they were actually good at. Absolutely. So that's a good law. It's a good law. Another good one is law number 20, the law of hype. Mate, I like this one a lot, is that when things are going well for a company, they really don't need the hype. But when 
you have the hype, it probably means you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. So, when you see huge hype about a product or, you know, something, yeah. you've, they're saying, insinuating that it's probably going to it's probably going to be cooked. It probably yeah. won't work because there's just too much hype about it. You know, the best things kind of just um, nudge in under the radar, undetected and end up huge. If you're number one, you don't need hype. The only person who needs hype is the... The new kid on the block who's got no sales is who's trying to get in front of everyone's minds. Whereas the cool dude up the top is just laying back thinking, I don't need this hype. Everybody knows I'm the best. I don't need to force it upon them because it's all going well. At the time, you might disagree with this, but if you think, say, some of the biggest companies in the world like Facebook and even Google, there wasn't much hype about them at the very mm. start. It wasn't like this huge, widely talked about thing when they entered. They just like slowly crept up and then only retrospectively we look back and think fuck how are we yeah. so addicted to facebook and google and you know they run much of our lives but there was definitely no hype at any stage along that process a gradual no, the, incline yeah nice there's a cool quote here he says that for the most part hype is hype real revolutions don't arrive at high noon with marching bands and full coverage on the 6 p.m news real revolutions arrive unannounced in the middle of the night and sneak up on you which i think is exactly what you just said there yes so that's a good law and uh you know We'll wrap it up toward the end now. And, and he, he finishes the whole book with a bit of a warning. And he says, if you violate the immutable laws, you run the risk of failure. Yeah, they're saying these are the laws, these 22 laws, you've got to follow them. And if not, you're in trouble. He says that they're not going to work straight away. But if you have patience, these immutable laws of marketing will help you achieve success. And to all the people who say you've been an idiot, he says that success is the best revenge of all. It is. Absolutely. So, mate, it's a ripper book. To, it's a weapon in terms of content, size. It's a very small book. Pretty much each of the 22 is like three to five pages each. So, yes. it's a pretty small book. Mm. And if anyone's in business or got any interest in going into business, I think the first, especially the first four chapters, oh, yeah. the law of category, um, you know, not trying to compete with the, the big dogs, try and be different and have a different spin and occupy a piece of someone's perceptions. Definitely. I like it a lot, mate. Sick marketing book. Um, and it's a it's another one of these sort of oldies but goodies in that, you know, if this book is still around 30, 40 years later, then there's probably something in there. <laughs>